Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Bob Akashrafi. Today is May 1st, 2020. We're speaking today with Natalia Molina, who is professor in the Department of American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. Thank you for joining us, Natalia. It's a pleasure. You have studied how ideas and attitudes about race interact with issues that arise in public health. How do you see these playing out in the COVID-19 epidemic? Just to give you some background, my first book, Fit to be Citizens, Public Health and Race in Los Angeles, was looking at the ways in which both science and public health shaped the meaning of race in the early 20th century. And so unlike a lot of works that study one ethnic or racialized group at a time, My book looked at the way that different groups coming to Los Angeles who were coming as laborers were uh, treated uh, by officials, including health officials. I first look at Chinese, Japanese, and then Mexicans. And I look at the way in which local health officials constructed ideas about race to demean, diminish, discipline, and define these racialized groups. And therefore, when we started seeing that xenophobia was on the rise with COVID-19. Of course, I was very interested in this topic and thought I might have something to say about it. So the first interview that I was asked to do was, I believe it was about March 2nd, and it was in Vox. And they wanted me to basically comment on what you, what you asked in terms of how do I see race intersecting uh, with ideas about health at this time. And so at that point, I was really interested in how we were seeing the same things that we saw in 1880, 1890, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, the ways in which Asian, Asian Americans were being treated as a yellow peril, as being more receptible to disease and not just their bodies, but places. So we started people seeing not, not wanting to go to restaurants in Chinatown, not wanting to shop in areas where there were large groups of Asian, Asian Americans. For example, I, I'm in Los Angeles, so in the San Gabriel Valley. And I really saw the ways in which people were using race as an organizing principle to define disease. About a week later, I was asked to give another interview, and in just that week, things had changed so rapidly. So now we were talking not just about the ways that race became an organizing principle for understanding disease, but the ways in which violence discourse was being targeted at Asian and Asian Americans. I think by the end of March, what we saw was that more than 1,000 acts of racism against Asian Americans had been reported. So not had been done, but had been reported because we know that people underreport these issues. While people are doing the most banal things, right? While they're going to get their coffee, while they're waiting for a bus, uh, there were examples of people yelling at an oncoming bus to run over a Chinese-American woman who was just waiting across the street. Uh, We're also seeing that Asian women are being more targeted than men in these very sexist ways. Of course, we're also seeing in the president's response this insistence on calling it the Chinese virus. Uh, Although we have seen that the World Health Organization has rejected identifying the virus with Chinese or any other people, Right, because this idea of focusing on a specific place creates something particular that could have happened anywhere. Uh, what I've tried to make clear in all the interviews that I've done with the press, because my goal right now is to get this message out to the public, we, we have to see how this idea of calling it the Chinese virus, what that would do is it would put our focus on the wrong things. It would influence our perception of of people and places as if some bodies, some places are are more risky than others. Um, Not only is it fueling an us-then divide, but again, it's using race as an organizing principle to define and identify disease in a way that makes us less safe. Uh, You know, disease isn't regulated to our nation's borders. It's not regulated to certain bodies.
Are there episodes from your historical work that will help us think about the way that we react to the public health crisis today and that show us options that we might pursue that we're not currently pursuing? Yes, I think that uh, in the examples that I gave in the way that Chinese were treated in the U.S. in the late 19th and early 20th century, what we saw then in places like Los Angeles was that these same attitudes, practices were then uh, applied to other groups. And in Los Angeles, uh, the, one of the next immigrant groups that followed Chinese after Japanese were Mexicans. And so my other work, I talk about this as being a, a racial script, that in a racial script is more than a stereotype. It's more than the cultural narratives, the stories we tell about groups, but it's all the ways in which those ideas uh, have certain teeth, the way that they're built into institutional structures and practices that form the scaffolding of race, like laws and policies. So just as Chinese had been scapegoated as disease carriers in earlier play scenarios in Hawaii, in San Francisco, such as uh, the work that Nayan Shah does in Contagious Divides, we saw the same thing happening in Los Angeles in 1916 during a typhus epidemic and 1924 during a bubonic plague. And here again, we see how race was used as an organizing principle for understanding disease. So uh, during both ep epidemics, but I'll focus on the 1924 bubonic plague, Mexican bodies were seen as disease carriers and therefore they were quarantined. They were, uh, children were segregated in their schools, neighborhoods were segregated. But of course, the reason that Mexican immigrants were here was for the labor. So when they needed them as laborers, they would uh, let them out of their neighborhoods. They would still let them um, immigrate to the United States, maybe you know, have some quarantine period. But disease was mainly seen as being regulated to Mexican neighborhoods, Mexican schools, the U.S.-Mexican border, in which disease was only seen as spreading in one direction. And so just as today we have this insistence of calling this the Wuhan virus or the Chinese virus, it's a very misleading way to understand how disease spreads. It's putting our emphasis on bodies and places instead of on uh, the virus itself, instead of practices such as hand washing, instead of large scale policies such as testing and um, antibody testing. And so we need to be able to understand this at more at the 40,000 foot level and what practices are best going to be seen as helping us get out of the situation or helping us, helping us weather the, this storm instead of continuing to use 19th century understandings about race to guide our 21st century medical and scientific practices. Are there examples, historical examples, of reactions or strategies by people who are targets of xenophobia or their allies? Are there strategies for responding that have been effective that we can learn from? I think some of the strategies that we've seen are both at the individual level as well as the collective le level. Some of these strategies, uh, people were able to make change, but not all the time. But what they are reminders of is how resilient we are and how we can work together to mark these moments as moments that continue to use medical nativism to see how disease marks groups as foreign and, and speak back to them. So when I think of something like Angel Island off the coast of San Francisco and the way that this was used as an immigration station and how intrusive the exams for Chinese were in this place, uh, again, that Nayan Shah talks about in Contagious Divides, and how the Chinese immigrants who were kept there in quarantine for you know an average of two weeks would write poems on the wall that stood as evidence to us that they were mistreated, that they were human beings and felt this injustice that was directed at them. Uh, I recently heard a, an interview with uh, Amy Tan, 
who now has a home. I believe it's in Sausalito and she can see Angel Island. And this home was built, you know, over a hundred years ago. So she talks about how the people who first lived in this home were looking at Angel Island and thinking that these practices made sense. And now you have someone like Amy Tan who understands this deep history of it. So we need to look back at those moments and see how people were already speaking back to, even as immigrants, even as people who were, you know, basically jailed at the time. We see the same thing during the 1916 typhus scare in Los Angeles that I mentioned. When I write about that in my book, Fit to be Citizens, and when I was first wondering, how did people speak back to this? How, what did they do about this? I was having trouble finding examples. I, I, I looked through all the kinds of places where laborers would have registered their complaints, uh, such as the California Immigration and Housing Commission. But uh, of course, they were immigrants, so they spoke to their consulate. And so I finally found those letters in Mexico City in the consulate offices there in their archival records. And what those uneducated laborers who left everything in Mexico to come here and toil at risk of their lives in order to help their families, even though they didn't have education, they knew that they were being targeted. And so they wrote to the consulate and they talked about, we are people too. They blame us for disease and yet they don't even give us soap. They blame us for disease and yet the kitchen and bathroom facilities are horrible. They're inadequate and they're dirty. And we see the same thing going on in ICE detention centers now. We see the same thing going on in prisons now. We tend to continue to stigmatize these places instead of really seeing what conditions they're toiling under. You mentioned several times the use of racial scripts in response to public health emergencies. Can you break down what is a racial script and how it functions? When we talk about racial scripts, if you take, for example, something like a disease carrier, right? It's very easy during COVID-19 for us to imagine how that is a racialized subject, uh, how that is someone who during this time period would be Asian. And we see the way that policies are already being formed around that. So it's not just the image, the cultural narrative, the representation, the way that every time you know people talk about COVID-19, especially at the beginning of this pandemic, the images they used were of Asians, even though any of us could have been carriers, even though by then the rates had been very high in Italy. And it's the institutional structures, the practices, the laws, the policies, that scaffolding of race. That's the other key part about racial scripts. And so when we talk about stopping flights from China, but continuing to let Americans who have been to China come into the U.S. That puts our emphasis on the racial script rather than the practice of what's going on, that somebody might have contracted the virus then. And so we see this, these racial scripts today affecting other groups. We see the ways in which xenophobia is reviving all kinds of scripts. So it's not just Asian and Asian Americans being targeted, right? It's the ways that it becomes so easy for Zoom bombing uh, of Shabbat services. It's the way that uh, Christian broadcasters like Rick Wiles is saying that you know, God is spreading this disease uh, in, in Jewish synagogues because they uh, you know, oppose Jesus Christ. It's the ways in which we see that even though we're all being told to use masks, that it's African-American men that are being targeted and told to leave certain establishments like Walmart in Illinois for wearing these surgical masks because we tend to still have this racial script of an African-American man as a criminal. And what's really pernicious about racial scripts is that they have a long fetch. This isn't just a script that will be active right now in this moment. This is a script that will become institutionalized and we'll continue to see the reverberations of it. So even though we're talking about ways to contain the virus now, and we're using that as justification for different practices, we're already seeing that people are planning, ah, how can I use this script after this is over? So we have senators like Tom Cotton of Arkansas saying, hey, if Chinese want to come to the U.S., 
to study Shakespeare and the Federalist Papers, that's what they need to learn from America. Of course, we might wonder why they need to learn about Shakespeare in America, Tom Cotton, but that they don't need to learn things like engineering or quantum computing or artificial intelligence here in the U.S., right? So we're already seeing the ways in which this racial script can start to spread out beyond public health beyond medicine in order to justify longstanding ideas about race and containment. You've discussed continuities that you've seen between the current epidemic and similar episodes in the past. Are there differences in the way that we're responding in particular with respect to race and the epidemic? I think one way in which we're seeing people respond is actually ways that might appear to be about race on the surface, but also has to do with class. So, you know, it's a very appropriate question or time to answer this on May 1st, on May Day. And the way that we see workers that feel disenfranchised saying that they're the ones on the front front lines, right? It's not just essential workers who are medical workers, but, you know, all of a sudden somebody who's a grocery clerk or delivering for Instacart is seen as an essential worker. And what we're seeing is that many of these workers might be people of color, but also working class whites, and that they're finding a certain solidarity with one another. We also saw it yesterday with the protests in Michigan at the Capitol building, right? Here's a racial script. Why is it that if African-Americans protest, they're seen as a group that needs to be contained, tear gassed as dangerous, and yet when white protesters do this at the Capitol with AK-47, they're seen as patriots. And one of the memes that I saw in response to it was posting the picture from the garbage workers strike in the 1960s where, you know, Black men are, are, marching with signs that say, I am a man, while the National Guard is pointing rifles at them. Uh, We're seeing that this idea of people in vulnerable positions are finding solidarity with one another. And another example would be the, the CARES Act that excluded undocumented workers. And yet we know that undocumented workers are often in industries that are being seen as essential workers, as agricultural workers bringing our produce to us, as working in that meatpacking industry that the president himself has said is an essential worker position. And so all these people uh, that might not have seen solidarity with one another now as workers and deemed essential workers at the same time that they are not being provided for in terms of testing, personal protective equipment, might find common cause with one another. And what I would hope is that these alliances would last beyond this moment. Natalia, thank you very much for sharing your work and your perspectives with us. Thank you for having me. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. And I'm Jessica Linker, a program coordinator at the Consortium. You can find other podcasts, video lectures, archival spotlights, as well as opportunities to connect to our community of scholars at chstm.org. This podcast is made possible with the generous support of the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Rita Allen Foundation.